Hello, beloved On Being listeners and friends. Many of you are asking how you can help support the work we're doing at the On Being Project. If we're fortunate enough to make it onto your list for giving this year, you can absolutely visit onbeing.org slash give. Your generosity of every kind is gratefully received. Thank you for being with us on this adventure. On Being is brought to you by the John Templeton Foundation. The Templeton Foundation supports academic research and civil dialogue on the deepest, most perplexing questions facing humankind. Who are we? Why are we here? And where are we going? To learn more, please visit templeton.org. The Templeton Foundation. Stay curious. Walter Brueggemann is one of the world's great teachers about the prophets who both anchor the Hebrew Bible and have transcended it across history. He translates their imagination from the chaos of ancient times to our own. He somehow also embodies this tradition's fearless truth-telling together with fierce hope and how it conveys that with disarming language. The task is reframing, he says, so that we can re-experience the social realities that are right in front of us from a different angle. Well, I think Martin Luther King did sometimes, you know, I, I think at his best, he was a biblical poet. If, if you just think of I Have a Dream, it, it just kind of soared away. He, he wasn't really talking about enacting a civil rights bill, except that he was, but it was language that was out beyond uh, the quarrels that we do. And uh, I think that happens from time to time like that. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being. I spoke with Walter Brueggemann in 2011. It was a thrill to meet this man, whose writings I'd so long admired. He's published dozens of books of theology, sermons, and prayers over the past four decades. So where I start with everyone is... um, I'd just like to hear a little bit about the religious background of your childhood. Yeah. Uh, I'm the son of a, uh, a pastor. My father was um, a German evangelical pastor in uh, rural Missouri, and I grew up in um, very much a church culture. And uh, I think that shaped me uh, not only as a believer, but it shaped me toward ministry. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, that's the flow of my life then, and uh, that was an antecedent of the United Church of Christ, so that's my home denomination and uh, mm-hmm. has been all my life. Yep. I, I read somewhere that you remembered the conflict when your father urged his congregation to abandon German. Oh, yes. It, so it was a German-speaking congregation? Yeah, well, uh, the, that, that crisis really came in the Second World War when uh, you didn't want to speak okay. German anymore. But my so it father, wasn't a theological decision? Or, or yeah. it was. <laughs> but it's like every immigrant community. The, the older people really thought that uh, true theological talk could only happen in your mother tongue. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, my father then preached once a month in German into the 1950s because the old people needed to hear those sounds. And uh, his insistence was, if you, don't, if you don't move away from that, you will, like every immigrant community, lose the next generation. I don't, this may be a stretch, but when I read that story, it made me wonder if, um, if that had anything to do with your later concern about you know, the particularities of language, of the biblical text, the, the preaching voice, the church and the world. Yeah. Did all of that form you? I think I never thought of it that way, but but I'm sure it does. Uh, uh, how one moves from language to language, and I really think that uh, Richard and Ryan Niebuhr, in, in whose uh, tradition I stand, one of the things that made them great is that they could move back and forth between those languages and between those cultures. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I think that particularity has been uh, very important to me. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I mean, so your book, The Prophetic Imagination, is re- continues to be such an important book. And I, I think it's probably, it's my fallback uh, position. And sometimes I look at it now and I think uh, either, gee, I already saw that then, 
or I think, wow, I haven't moved at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. I mean, there is a sense in which everything you've done since then builds on That's that right. and it, flows it from it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But so I, I guess I'm still kind of curious. So, so, you know, how did you get captured by that, the prophetic imagination? in particular, in, in this text? Well, these uh, my, my uh, teacher in my uh, doctoral work was James Meilenberg, and Jeremiah was his thing. And he's the one um, that really taught me to pay attention to the nuance of the language. And, uh, you know, and if, you, if you just keep looking at these same texts every day of your life, year after year, you, you either give up on it mm-hmm. or you get taken in by it. And uh, the force of their language is just kind of inexhaustible. So I would always tell my students as we were studying the prophets, uh, this stuff sounds like it was written yesterday mm-hmm. uh, because the, the contemporaneity of it is uh, so immediate. And that was something that captured you about the prophets it did right indeed, away. yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, as you know, um, most people don't have theological education. Most Christians don't have theological educations. Right. Most Christians um, don't even necessarily have really basic tools for right. reading those texts yep. in a powerful and nuanced way. So if I ask you kind of the, the introductory question, I ask you to be a teacher. You know, if you had to say, what, who, who, who were the prophets? You know, what, what were they about? And what's particular about that piece of the Bible? Well, I think they were... Um the two things that are important, it seems to me, is on the one hand, um, they were rooted in the covenantal traditions of whatever it was from Moses and Sinai and all of that. And the other thing is that they are completely um, uncredentialed and without pedigree. Okay. <laughs> so they just rise up uh, in the landscape. And um, um, the way I put it now is that they imagine their contemporary world differently according to that old tradition. So it's, uh, it's tradition and imagination. Uh, there's no way to explain that, so we explain it by the work of the Spirit, uh, but I don't think you have to say that. I, I just think they are moved the way every good poet is moved to have to describe the world differently according to the gifts of their insight. Hmm. And, and, of course, in their own time and every time since, uh, the, the people that, that control the power structure uh, do not know what to make of them, uh, so they characteristically try to silence them. Hmm. And what power people always discover is that you cannot finally silence poets. <laughs> they just keep coming at you and, uh, <laughs> in threatening and... Um, hmm and transformative ways. Mm. Yeah. So you have your Bible with you, and I mean, if I asked you just to read what for you is a... I mean, I, I, so I, I want to also step back and say there are a number of prophets, right? And they have very different characteristics, voices, themes. Uh, they were speaking to different times right. in the history of the Israelites. So there's not one prophet or one prophetic voice. But if I just ask you to choose kind of a quintessential... Uh, passage, maybe Jeremiah, maybe yeah. Isaiah, yeah. Uh, yeah. or or maybe just one that that has remained especially meaningful to you over the years, yeah. and just kind of well, let so I'll I'll, uh, I'll read uh, since the prophets characteristically revolve around judgment and hope. Uh, I'll do two passages and okay. one of each of them. The uh, judgment passage uh, that I'll uh, read is in Jeremiah four. Uh, it goes like this, um, I looked, and you don't know who I is, I looked on the earth, and lo, it was waste and void, and to the heavens, and they had no light. I looked on the mountains, and lo, they were quaking, and all the hills moved to and fro. I looked, and lo, there was no one at all, and all the birds of the air had fled. I looked, and lo, the fruitful land was a desert, and all its cities were laid waste before the anger, before his fierce anger. Well, uh, you get the I looked, I looked, I looked, and what that text really is, is creation in reversal. Mm. Uh, So you go from heaven and earth to mountains to birds to humans, Mm. and he's describing it all being taken away at one time. And um, when I hear that kind of poetry, I get chill bumps because it, it seems to me so contemporary that 
I think that's how very many people are now experiencing the world. It is as though the ordered world uh, is being taken away from us. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. it's just so powerful and exquisite. The other text I'll read is Isaiah uh, 43. It's a very much uh, used passage. Uh, Do not remember the former things, nor the consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? And apparently what he's, what he's telling his people is just forget about the Exodus, forget about all the ancient miracles, and pay attention to the new miracles of mm. rebirth and new creation that God is enacting before your very eyes. Mm. Mm. And uh, I, I often wonder when I read that, what was it like the day the poet got those words and what, what, what did it feel like and how did he share that? And, of course, we don't know any of that. So it just uh, it just keeps ringing in our ears. Mm. It, you and I were together this morning at a gathering of uh, preachers, and um, I think that that both of those themes that you named of you know what feels like chaos, yep. but then the hope that, and I think I think even an insistence that this must somehow give rise to new forms. Yep. The fact that we don't know how the world is going to be structured differently or right. you know, what will survive that we recognize makes it still stressful, even if it's hopeful. But That's right. But, but the amazing uh, contemporaneity of this material is that the issues are the same, uh, that, that the world we have trusted in is vanishing before our eyes and the world that is coming at us uh, feels like a threat to us, and we can't quite see the shape of it. And I think that is kind of where the the church and the preachers of the church uh, have to live. And uh, people don't much hear, want to hear either one of those words that the world is vanishing or that the new a new world is coming to us. Mm -hmm. Which is why this uh, this kind of poetry always uh, leaves us uneasy. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think that you also think that that unease is a holy thing, or can be a holy thing. That in fact the Bible calls the faithful not to be too settled and well, too I think comfortable. That, I, think, I think that's exactly right. Um, that's countercultural, though. It is countercultural because our our consumer culture wants somehow to. Uh, narcoticize us so that we just settle in on things. And I think, uh, I, I think Kafka maybe said that a, that a poet or a novelist is like a pickaxe uh, that attacks the way we've got things arranged. And I think these poems are like uh, pickaxes that are, uh, that are not welcome among us. But but we're gonna we're gonna miss out on the reality of our life if we are narcoticized both about the loss and about the newness. You know, here's um, here's here's some words from the prophetic imagination in your book in 1978. They're very poetic too. Our consumer culture, following on what you just said, our consumer culture is organized against history. There is a deprecation of memory and a ridicule of hope which means everything must be held in the now, either an urgent now or an eternal now. Well, I'm glad I said that. <laughs> I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being. Today, Walter Brueggemann's Prophetic Imagination. You know, you're naming something when you call the prophets poets. Yeah. You're naming qualities uh, of the, this, this text, this Bible that 
people think they know so well, but yep. in fact, and partly because of the way these things were translated and transmitted, yep. Yep. Uh, I, I don't think I grew up r- realizing how much po- how much of the Bible is poetry. That's right. And the, the other thing that you, the reason that also matters, and that's especially that's true of the Hebrew Bible in particular, and 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 also this realization, which is very simple but not brought home very often, very often is that this was this was the text of Jesus. This was his that's scripture. Right. That's right. And he he obviously knew it so well. But even even in the, the the more liberal theological tradition in which I was raised, we only talked about the prophets as moral teachers, mm-hmm. and there was no attention to the artistic, aesthetic quality of how they did that. But it is the only way in which you can think outside of the box. Uh, otherwise, e- even liberal passion for justice just becomes another ideology mm. and it does not have transformative power. That That's what's extraordinary about the poetry, uh, that it's so uh, elusive that it doesn't, it refuses to be reduced to a formula. Okay. And uh, I think that's a great temptation among liberals who care about justice is to reduce it to a formula and to then create the, the, another ism. That's right. Mm-hmm. And then the poetry comes and, and breaks that open mm, again. That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, right. That's that power of language and, and forms right. of language. That's right. Yeah. You know, so one thing I thought might be interesting is um, to walk through some of the words that um, that are there in your writing that come from these prophetic texts right. um, that are not words in that are really part of a modern vocabulary. Uh, you know, one of them is uh, lamentations. Yeah. You know, what? tell me about well, lamentations. Well, uh, uh, lamentation is a, is a big piece of my research and my passion. Um, the, the Book of Lamentations uh, is a collection of poems that grieve the loss of Jerusalem that's been destroyed. But the Book of Psalms, at least one-third of the Book of Psalms, are uh, songs or prayers of sadness and loss and grief and upset uh, so that uh, very much the Old Testament experience of faith uh, is having stuff taken away from us. And what's so interesting is that in the institutional church with the lectionary and the liturgies, the whole business of lamentations has been screened out hmm. uh, because oh, I think in— Because we don't know what to do with those depressing passages. <laughs> yeah, and we don't want to uh-huh. because of consumer capitalism. You just go from triumph to triumph to well-being to ease to prosperity, and uh, you never have any brokenness. My, uh, m- my way of teaching that is to say that, that the destruction of Jerusalem— is the Old Testament equivalent to 9-11. That's their 9-11. You know, I just remembered that in the days after 9-11, I interviewed a bunch of people, including, and I can't even remember who this was, but some pastor, theologian, biblical scholar who read that first line of Lamentations, how yep. lonely sits the city. Yeah, yeah. It, it, just, it just fits so well. And because we have neglected the lament pieces, we are ill-equipped uh, for the loss that we are facing in our society. Mm. So we keep pretending and denying uh, that that's not happening to us. Mm. Yeah, I felt like one of the spiritual experiences of 9-11, not that we maybe knew how to name this, that's what you're talking about, right. was Americans experienced vulnerability in their strongest fortresses which is an experience that a lot of people in the world have a lot of the time, but it was completely new to us That's right. in this generation. That's right. And I think particularly for young people who didn't even have uh, the Second World War behind them as my generation right, does. Right, right. Uh, we, just, we just thought it could not happen here. Mm-hmm. But that's exactly what they thought in Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. They thought we are God's guaranteed people and it can't happen here. And uh, that's what produced this incredible poetry, I think. Mm. And, uh, yeah. Right. A word you've used a lot recently, maybe you always used it, I think it echoes in what you wrote it, but is disruptive. Yeah, no, that's, <laughs> that's, that's more recent in okay. my, well, tell my, me very, about that my very limited vocabulary. Yeah. Tell me about that word. Um, 
uh, again, I don't think that's a word we associate in American culture with religion or the Bible or churches. Yeah. Well, I, I think uh, we think in terms of uh, systems and continuities and predictability and schemes and plans. And uh, uh, I think uh, the Bible is to some great extent focused on God's capacity uh, to break those schemes open and to violate those formulae. When they are positive disruptions, the Bible calls them miracles. We, we tend not to use that word uh, when they are negative. Right. Uh, but, but what it means is that, that uh, the, the reality of our life and the reality of God are not contained in most of our explanatory schemes. And whether one wants to explain uh, that in terms of God or not, it is nonetheless the truth of our life uh, that our lives are uh, arenas for all kinds of disruptions <laughs> because it doesn't work out the way we planned. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think uh, our, our uh, recent economic collapse uh, is a huge disruption for many people who had their retirement mapped out or, or whatever like that, and it isn't going to be like that. And what the Bible pretty consistently does is to refer all of those disruptions uh, to the hidden power of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I heard you speak very poignantly this morning to preachers about the fact that there are things that can't be said from the pulpit, sometimes that it feels like they should be said. You said there are silences that it's hard to break. Yeah. Um, that, that, that following on the way we're talking about this, it's hard for preachers, religious leaders to adopt this prophetic voice or draw on these prophetic themes. Yep. And, you know, I think even when, if you and I talk about this, it's, gonna, it's kind of a difficult conversation to have in this culture. Uh, it's a very difficult. Right? And, and, I, and I think the difficulty is uh, that all of us liberals and conservatives, all of us are basically contained in the ideology of consumer capitalism. And we want that to be our universe of meaning. And when you get a poetic articulation that moves outside of that, it's just too anxiety producing for most of us. So we try to stop that kind of talk. And, and in a local church, obviously, uh, people have a lot of leverage for being able to stop that kind of talk. So what is it hard for preachers to talk about here? What, what? Well, I, th I think uh, at, at the broadest level, it is hard to talk about the fact, I think it's a fact, uh, that our society has chosen a path of death in which we have um, reduced everything to a commodity. We believe that there are uh, technical solutions to everything. So it doesn't matter whether you talk about the, the um, over-reliance on technology, the mad pursuit of t commodity goods, uh, our passion for violence now expressed as our war policies. All of those are interrelated to each other and none of us, uh, very few of us, none of us uh, really want to have that exposed as an inadequate and dehumanizing way to live. And I think if one is uh, grounded in the truth of the gospel as a Christian, um, that's what we have to talk about. So preachers are really put in a very difficult fix of having been entrusted to talk about that stuff. Yeah, but they also, and they also belong to this That's culture. That's right. And these characteristics are part of our birthright. That's right. They are. And preachers are as deep, we are as deeply implicated in it as anyone else. That's exactly right. I think that this larger point that, that you've been making about the aesthetic, literary, poetic sensibility of, of the prophetic tradition, that, that the very language is different and transformative, um, that it, 
takes that voice out of political boxes. Yeah. Because um, I'm really aware that uh, a lot of words that religious people treasure and that are core, I mean, the word justice, the yeah. word peace, these words themselves are, are tarnished in our culture. That's they right. they have all kinds of political association and baggage, right? I mean, that's right. They, they're liberal or they're conservative yep. or they belong to some agenda. That's right. And all of that accumulates around that's it. That's right. The message is not clear, and the message may not be powerful, and it may not be heard. That's right. Which is why a poetic preacher always has to try to find another way to say it. I've I've recently been thinking more and more, it's so astonishing that the Old Testament prophets hardly ever discuss an issue. Uh, they don't discuss you abortion or issue. the <laughs> Panama Canal or, the, or, yeah. or anything like that. And, and, I, and I think what they're doing is they're going underneath the issues that preoccupy people to the more foundational assumptions that can only be gotten at in elusive language. Mm. And very much the, the institutional church has been preoccupied with issues. Mm -hmm. Which automatically puts you on one side of an issue or correct. on the other side and, of the and, issue. And, 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 when, and when we do that, uh, we are robbed of transformative power. Because then we just, it's ideology versus ideology mm -hmm. uh, that, that does not produce very good outcomes for anyone. Can you think of an example where you've seen a, a, a religious leader or a community kind of subvert that? I mean, get 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 outside that issues based or. Well, I think Martin Luther King did sometimes. Um, you know, I, I think at his at his best, he was a biblical poet. Right. If you, if you right, just right. think of "I Have a Dream," right. Which is it, a it just kind of mm -hmm. soared away. He he wasn't really talking about enacting a civil rights bill, except that he was. And, you know, but but it was it was language that was out beyond uh, the quarrels that we do. And uh, I, I think that happens from time to time like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you make the connection. I, I really enjoyed reading some of your sermons. Uh, you have a new book, a new collection of mm -hmm. sermons, right? So yeah. I had the galleys of that. Yeah. It hasn't yeah. been well, published. Yeah, and I, I don't, loved so. that. Well, well, no. <laughs> I didn't correct it for right. you, sorry. Um, but it, this, I think, was from one of your sermons. Uh, you were talking about the need for a city to care about injustice or poverty and despair is not liberalism or socialism or welfare or radicalism. I mean, after all, liberals and conservatives share those same biblical texts, right. right? But you said it is simply genuine humanness authorized by the God of the Bible. Even drawing that, circling back to that connection. Yeah, yeah. Then kind of reframes, well, what's at stake yeah. here? And I think very much it, it is, it, it's so hard to do, but the task is reframing so that we can re-experience the social realities that are right in front of us from a different angle. After a short break, more with Walter Brueggemann. You can always listen again and hear the unedited version of every conversation I have on the On Being podcast feed, now with special occasional bite-sized extras. Get it wherever podcasts are found. Support for On Being with Krista Tippett comes from the Fetzer Institute, helping build the spiritual foundation for a loving world. Fetzer envisions a world that embraces love as a guiding principle and animating force for our lives. A powerful love that helps us live in sacred relationship with ourselves, others, and the natural world. Learn more by visiting Fetzer.org. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being. Today, the prophetic imagination of Walter Brueggemann. He's one of the world's greatest living teachers about the prophets who both anchor the Hebrew Bible and have transcended it in many places across history. A figure like Isaiah, whose words also echo in churches at Christmas time. 
Sitting with Walter Brueggemann is to experience something of the fearless truth-telling and the fierce hope of this tradition he knows so well. And as we've been hearing, he brings the idea of prophetic imagination into our own complex and chaotic times. You know, something else that comes up in my mind, uh, you were you were introduced um, as someone who's strident, said proudly strident. <laughs> and the prophets were strident, right? They were uncomfortable. That's right. I think also, I've thought about this a lot because we do, you know, I've done a lot of conversations across the years about uh, some historic figures. I mean, people who changed the world usually yeah. were not, po- they often started in their 20s. And before everyone realized they'd changed the world, that's they, right. were, that's they right. drove everyone around them crazy, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> and that's what the prophets do in the, yep. in the Bible. That's yep. the model. Yep. Um, and then right now, at this moment in time in our culture, we have this world which feels like it's been poisoned by giving so much attention to strident voices, right? Mm-hmm. Only strident voices on every side of any issue. So do you, do you struggle to champion the prophetic voice? Uh, or how do you define that over against righteous indignation, yeah. right? Or, or stridency that, that, is, that is really, that is toxic. Yeah. Because well, it may not look so different. Do you know what right. I'm saying? Yes, I, I, I would... Uh, <laughs> You know, I wouldn't choose to use the word strident for myself, but I, it, it is deliberate on my part when I get to talk to clergy that I do a lot of to do what I do as boldly as I can to try to model and energize preachers to be bold about what they do. But I think it is uh, the courage that comes from the conviction that you've been entrusted with something important. Uh, and I, if you do it that way, rather than it being a self-announcement, the accent is on the message and not the messenger. Uh, it doesn't need to be uh, strident in an alienating kind of way. Okay, so that's one way to make a distinction. That's right. Uh-huh. That, that, that what one would wish is that it is emancipatory for people who are hearing you rather than affrontive. But it is a very delicate line, mm-hmm. and uh, I no doubt cross over that sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Who do you think of? Uh, did you think of people who you imagine as prophets among us today? Well, a uh, king, obviously, mm-hmm. uh, Bishop Tutu. I, re- I read a, mm-hmm. a biography of him, and I had no idea how long he had been courageous before he became Bishop Tutu. Right, <laughs> right. And I guess maybe in the, it's in the nature of this that you don't recognize a prophet in their lifetime. I think that's right. It, it's, it's kind of in retrospect. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I, I think if the... If the prophets of the Old Testament really were uncredentialed people without pedigrees, uh, then we ought not to expect people to arise primarily in the institutional church. Right. Or even maybe be famous people. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there are a lot of people who are not broadly famous who in their own local circumstance do transformative things. Are those those good, life-giving, disruptive forces. That's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you said somewhere in another interview, uh, I'm always a little bit careful about quoting other interviews because you, they don't always get written down correctly. Right. But I, I, I wanted to ask you about this because it was very intriguing that some of these issues, sexual issues that are so galvanizing and so polarizing yeah. in our time, in churches and outside them, yeah. you said that you really don't think that's about particularities of guilt or sin, but about a sense of impending chaos. Yes. Which kind of yep. goes back to that first prophetic text you That's read. right, yeah. So are you saying that people have a sense of impending chaos and for some reason, maybe because these things are so intimate, this is what they latch on to? As- That's exactly what I think. I've, I've asked myself, why in the church does the question of gays and lesbians have such adrenaline? And I've decided uh, for myself... Uh, that that means most of what we're arguing about with gays and lesbians has nothing to do with gays and lesbians. It is rather that the world is not the way we thought it was going to be. I think what has happened is that we've taken all of our anxiety about the the old world disappearing and we've dumped it all on that issue. 
Uh, and, and so I have concluded that it's almost futile to have the theological argument about gays and lesbians anymore because that's not what the argument's about. I see. Uh, it is an amorphous anxiety uh, that we are in free fall as a society. And I, I think we kind of are in free fall as a society, but I don't think it has anything to do with gays and lesbians okay. particularly. Mm. Yeah. You know, another one of those words that it recurs a lot in your writing that comes also from the text is, um, it's another word that we don't have in our culture very often, is mercy. You know, mm-hmm. We talk about forgiveness, we talk about reconciliation. Yep. Mercy to me is something different, something bigger and... Yep. Tell me about uh, that. Um, you may know that the... Uh, Hebrew word for, Phyllis Tribble has taught us that the Hebrew word for mercy is the word for womb mm-hmm. with different vowel points. Uh, and so mercy, she suggested, is womb-like mother love. And it is the capacity of the mother to totally give oneself over to the need and reality and identity of the child. And uh, mutatis mutandis, then, uh, mercy is the capacity uh, to give oneself away for the sake of the neighborhood. Now, none of us do that completely, uh, but it makes a difference if, if the quality of social transactions have to do with the willingness to give oneself away for the sake of the other, rather than the need to always be drawing all of the resources uh, to myself for my own well-being. So it is this, this kind of generous connectedness to others. And then I think our task is to see how that translates into policy. Uh, and now we're having huge political storms about whether our policies uh, ought to reflect that kind of generosity to people other than us and, and people to, uh, who are not as well off as we are or uh, whatever. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I think that a, that a community or a society finally cannot live um, without the quality of mercy. Uh, the, the problem for us is... Um, what will initiate that, what will, what will break the pattern of self-preoccupation enough to notice that the others are out there and that we are attached to them. That word merciful is also connected to womb. It's the same. Well, it wouldn't surprise would the me. Same, if, if it, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know what? It, it, it takes me back to a conversation I had with a clinical psychologist who's studying forgiveness and revenge and how forgiveness is made more possible. And I mean, I mean it's studying what happens in the brain, right? Mm-hmm. And that biologically, we become able to care in larger and larger, wider and wider circles when we see others' well-being is linked to our own. Yes. And, of course, the mother, the womb, and the, the, the maternal love is, the, is an ultimate expression of that. That's right, because the whole womb process is a terrible inconvenience. <laughs> right, right. But, but, but it's an inconvenience. I know that better than you do. <laughs> uh, I bet you do. But, yeah. but it's an inconvenience that finally is defining for our life mm-hmm. as the mother lives into. Mm-hmm. I'd love to talk about... Um, your image of God. And I want you to talk about that more personally, but I, I thought I might start, uh, you know, for, for example, in one of your sermons, you are talking about some poetry, Isaiah. And you talk about th- that it offers five images for God. This is just one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> one passage in Isaiah. Yeah. A demolition squad, a safe place for poor people who have no other safe place the giver of the biggest dinner party you ever heard of, 
a powerful sea monster, he will swallow up death forever, a gentle nursemaid who will wipe away every tear from all faces. How are normal people, not biblical scholars, how are they to make sense of a text like that, of a God, of who God is? Well, they're going to make sense of it if they had good preachers and teachers <laughs> to, to help them pause long enough to take in the imagery. But you see, what, what the church does with its creeds and its doctrinal tradition, it flattens out all the images and metaphors to make it fit into a nice little formulation, and then it's deathly. So we have to communicate to people, if you want a God that is healthier than that, you're going to have to take time to sit with these images and relish them and let them become a part of your um, prayer life and your vocabulary and your conceptual frame. Otherwise, you're just going to be left with these uh, dead formulations, mm. uh, which, again, is why, is why the, the poetry is so important right. because the poetry just keeps opening and opening and opening Whereas the doctrinal practice of the church is always to close and close and close until you are left with nothing that has any transformative power. Mm -hmm. So more metaphors gives more access to God, and uh, one can work one metaphor a while, but you can't treat that as though that's the last word, and mm -hmm. you got to move and have another and another. That's what I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it just amazing. In Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, there are just endless metaphors. Yeah. It is, dwelling with the images again is very different from memorizing Bible verses. That's right. And it's even different from reading the Bible. That's right. That's right. I, I, th I happen to think memorizing Bible verses is a good thing <laughs> because then you have, the, you have the text available that can yield this stuff. Because what a metaphor or an image does is to invite you to keep walking around it and looking at it another way and noticing something else. It's a gift that keeps on giving. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being. Today, the prophetic imagination of Walter Brueggemann. So if I asked you this way, um, in terms of your image of God, you know, are there metaphors that have spoken to you across time or that speak to you now? That didn't before. Are there are there metaphors that have come to you in all in your life as a human being and in your study as a scholar and your work as a preacher to be more and more meaningful? Well, I think they arise. They basically arise out of my continuing to look at the text, and uh, it depends on what text I'm looking at. Obviously, that is then related to what's going on in my life uh, that day. Um, for example, if I take the phrase, and I, I can't even remember where it is, uh, but let me be the apple of your eye. That's a very strange phrase. Right. But what that pictures is a, a God who's a big eye that looks at you caringly and treasuring you. So what I imagine from that, it's like being a little kid that's lost in a department store and you finally go around the corner, and there's your mother looking at you, <laughs> and you're safe again. Right. So I want to have God look at me that way. Now I, I don't want to I don't want to construct a whole theology out of that phrase, but that's enough for that day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll find uh, I'll, I'll be given another phrase another day like that. So that's kind of how my mind works. Um, it, does, it doesn't yield a doctrinal package. Uh, it just yields a bunch of fragments uh, that are not easily fit together. But the reason that works for me 
uh, is that I am aware that that I, as a person with identity, I am essentially a collection of fragments that do not fit very well together. So that's okay. Hmm. Um, I did. I did want to read this to you. This was from a sermon. I just want to read it because I thought it was beautiful. You wrote that God is the map whereby we locate the setting of our life, that God is the water in which we launch our life raft, that God is the real thing from which and toward which we receive our being and identify ourselves. It follows that the kind of God at work in your life will determine the shape and quality and risk at the center of your existence. It matters who God is. Hmm. I'm glad I said that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, again, even just following on all of this, there's, because of the very complex and, and as you say, poetic way in which God finds expression in the text, mm, there's a way in which God gets to evolve with us, right, through life. Right. Yep. That's right. So God brought the speech is a very supple reality uh, in which uh, we exercise great freedom in whom God is now permitted to be among us. Mm. I learned that when my uh, son was uh, about seven and at our table prayers before I caught on to the gender problem of language, I always addressed God as Father, and uh, that night I thought I would be Jewish, and I addressed God as King of the Universe. And I, I and I remember my son had his head bowed, and he came up with eyes as big as saucers because he had never heard God said mm. that way. Well, in retrospect, it wasn't much of a move from Father to King. But you can make more moves the same way so that, so that every time you find another way of saying it, the reality of God is opened uh, very differently, and, and that's what they did. You know? mm. And, of course, Jesus' parables then work that right. very much the same way. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I would love for you just to read a little bit more a psalm that you love right now. I don't know. Um, The the, the book of Psalms ends with these sort of outrageous doxologies. Okay. Um, uh, But this is, uh, Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps, fire, hail, snow, frost, stormy wind filling his command, Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and cedars, wild animals and cattle, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth, princes and all rulers, young men and women, all old and young together. And and it's an image of of all creatures joining in doxology. And I love that to think that sea monsters, I I don't know the sea monsters (laughs) howl or what they, how they express their faith, but it, but it's, it's an early form of all creatures of our God and King. You know, the whole world is coming in doxology, and I just think it's so so wonderful. Yep. I just I just read a book recently, and I don't know whether it's right, but it says that Socrates said that all true speech ends in doxology to God. I I hope he said that. And if he didn't, he should have. Walter Brueggemann is William Marcellus McFeeters Professor Emeritus at Columbia Theological Seminary in Georgia. His books include The Prophetic Imagination, Collected Sermons of Walter Brueggemann, and Tenacious Solidarity, Biblical Provocations on Race, Religion, Climate, and the Economy.
On Being is Chris Hegel, Lily Percy, Mariah Helgeson, Maya Tarrell, Marie Sambalay, Aaron Farrell, Lauren Dordal, Tony Liu, Bethany Iverson, Aaron Colasacco, Kristen Lynn, Prophet Adewu, Casper Tech Kyle, Angie Thurston, Sue Phillips, Eddie Gonzalez, Lillian Vo, Lucas Johnson, Damon Lee, Suzette Burley, Katie Gordon, Zach Rose, and Siri Grassley. Our lovely theme music is provided and composed by Zoe Keating. And the last voice you hear singing our final credits in each show is hip-hop artist Lizzo. On Being was created at American Public Media. Our funding partners include the John Templeton Foundation, supporting academic research and civil dialogue on the deepest and most perplexing questions facing humankind. Who are we? Why are we here? And where are we going? To learn more, visit templeton.org. The Fetzer Institute, helping to build the spiritual foundation for a loving world. Find them at Fetzer.org. Calliopeia Foundation, working to create a future where universal spiritual values form the foundation of how we care for our common home. Humanity United, advancing human dignity at home and around the world. Find out more at HumanityUnited.org, part of the Omidyar Group. The Henry Luce Foundation, in support of public theology reimagined. The Osprey Foundation, a catalyst for empowered, healthy, and fulfilled lives. And the Lilly Endowment, an Indianapolis-based private family foundation dedicated to its founders' interests in religion, community development, and education. On Being is distributed by PRX, the public radio exchange, and is a Krista Tippett public production. Ah.